What do you do when the thing that goes bump in the night is right outside of your tent? Try to run, hide, fight, or does the story end right there? With the tent lining being torn open and your body being pulled into the frigid night by your worst fears incarnate. Your heart is racing and your eyes are locked on the thin film of the plastic wall and the sound of footsteps draw near. What do you do? Never mind. It's too late. It's already here. Today we'll be discussing the story of those who have visited Port Lock, Alaska since its abandonment and the evidence behind the legend. Port Lock, a small fishing town in Alaska, was left abandoned after being terrorized by a creature known as the Nantanak. The last survivor of the town left in 1951, but some people have been brave enough to return to the area since then, and the mystery does live on. Some of those people have been unfortunate enough to have close brushes with the beast. One such encounter happened to a group of men who found themselves stranded in the heart of the Nantanak's hunting grounds. What began as a hunting trip for Ed and his friends Dennis and Joe quickly turned into a nightmare as night fell and the men were forced to make camp only to find that they were not alone. The following is a story based on an account shared by Ed. August 1973, three friends, Ed, Dennis, and Joe, find themselves aboard their boat headed home after a hunting expedition near Dogfish Bay. Above their heads, dark clouds were quickly gathering and the waters of the bay had turned violent. Not wanting to be caught in the storm, the men made their way to shore, only miles from the infamous Port Lock. The three were in relatively good spirits as they pitched their tent, a thin, dark green canvas tarp held by a single strong pole in the center and tethered to the ground around the edges. After setting up the tent, the men cooked dinner and set about getting ready for bed. They left the fire going and made sure to empty their pots and pans as to not attract any bears that might be nearby. Then one by one, they entered the tent and each slowly fell asleep to the sound of the ocean wind blowing against the towering pines outside of the canvas wall. Around two in the morning, Dennis woke Ed. There's something outside of the tent, he whispered softly. The men lied there listening as something slowly made its way around the tent in a circle. It wasn't a bear. Whatever this thing was, it was walking on two legs. Then without warning, the noise vanished. Their hearts pounding, the three men barely slept that night. In the morning, the camp was silent and Ed, Dennis, and Joe didn't utter a word about what had happened. Perhaps out of embarrassment, or maybe fear that something would come out of the woods if they did. The three men found themselves still under the storm, with the waves crashing against the rocks near the beach. They were going to be trapped here at least one more night. As the day wore on, the three friends began to relax and even enjoy themselves. Convinced that they had simply overreacted the night before. In Alaska, in August, the sun doesn't set until well into the evening. So the men's confidence waxed stronger as the sun's light finally set around 11 p.m. Besides, what could possibly happen, they thought. They had their rifles the rifles were fully loaded, and they had flashlights close at hand. Once again, each man slowly nodded off. Then suddenly, around 2 a.m., Ed felt a hand seize hold of his leg. His eyes shot open, and he half expected to see his own death staring back at him. In the darkness, he could make out Dennis's face with a single shaking finger pressed to his lips, quietly urging Ed not to make any noise. 
Ed looked over to Joe and saw him clutching his rifle. The year in the tent was dead, and the only sound that echoed in Ed's ears was his heartbeat, until a twig snapped behind the green canvas wall of the tent. Something was about ten feet behind the tent, and it was slowly getting closer. The three men were frozen, and seconds felt like eternity as whatever was outside the tent reached the tent wall and then continued to move around the tent in a methodically slow circle. The tension was unbearable, but one of the men couldn't stand it any longer. He shot out of the tent and flashed his light around the perimeter. To his horror, there in the darkness staring into his soul was nothing. A void, where something had only been seconds before. But, but how, how could this, how could this be, he thought. The three stayed vigilant and made it through the night, biding their time until morning brought some reprieve. The morning sun shone out in a dark haze as the storm was still thick overhead. The three men were in disbelief of what had just happened, and according to the ferocious black waters roaring at the end of the beach, they would surely be trapped here one more night. One more night trapped with that thing. Fortunately, our story has a happy ending. Unlike many others who crossed paths with the Nantanak, the three men were not visited again and the storm broke the morning of the third day. They left on their boat and survived to share their experience. The previous story was shared in a 2009 article by the Homer Tribune, entitled, Poor Chatham, Left of the Spirits. In the same article, a person who had to flee Port Lock shares her account. The person's name is Melania Kell. She is a pivotal piece of the Port Lock puzzle. Born in 1934, Melania was forced to leave her home with her family as they fled from the terror of the Nantanak. She explained that her family had lived in a home near the beach, but that they had left their home behind when poor Locke was essentially evacuated. She recounted the death of her godfather, Andrew Kamlick, in 1931, when his head was smashed in by a piece of logging equipment that no single man could have lifted. Whatever killed Andrew, then tossed the log mover like a twig about ten feet away from his body. Blood was everywhere, but there were no answers to be found. Melania's story was then followed by another village elder, Simon Vasnikov. Simon shared the tales of the miner who went missing without a trace, and of Tom Larson's harrowing encounter with the Nantanak as he stared at the creature down the sights of his rifle. It wasn't going to be simply shooting an animal, but something that appeared to be much more than that. He slowly lowered his rifle and stepped back into the bush as the creature retreated. So, how much of the tale of Portlock is true? Well, something is definitely off in Portlock. It's important to acknowledge that the local Agutique people do believe in the Alawak or the Nantanak so much so that they have dedicated information about the creature on their website, alutiquemuseum.org, a page that describes the beast as being half man and half creature. The very phrase in Alutik, ahola tan hota gait chume, means they used to see Bigfoot. The Alutik have lived in the region where the Aluak or Nantanak has lived for 7,500 years. There are other Alaskan tribes that have similar accounts of creatures highly reminiscent of the Nantanak. The Anubiad Eskimos refer to a similar beast as Kushtaka, which shares a very unique and common distinction to the Nantanak that differs from the typical Bigfoot. They can shapeshift and even take human form to deceive people. Both creatures are known for being potentially mild-mannered or 
for being predatorial when the situation calls for it. The Yupik people also describe the Urayali, which is also similar to the Nantanak. All three have been described as tall, covered in dark hair, with certain almost human features. Let's review some of the facts that were covered in part one of the Borlock Alaska series. If you haven't seen part one, I invite you to go watch it now. It's available to be viewed on our channel. In 1779, the Spanish did land in Portlock and they did evacuate the area following several deaths due to a mysterious illness. Nathaniel Portlock did visit the area, although it's debated as to where he landed exactly, whether it was in Portlock or further up the Kenai Peninsula. It does appear that his landing parties found an abandoned native village. In 1867, an article was published by a San Francisco newspaper reporting on the murders in the Portlock area by cannibalistic giants. There also are records of the 1905 single season abandonment of the town by natives working in the industry due to the belief that they were being watched by something in the woods. After considerable research, however, we were unable to locate death certificates for the reportedly passed individuals. The town was abandoned finally in 1951, but this is also around the time that a major highway system was entering the area. A common explanation is that the people migrated north in the peninsula to have better access to these new roads and in turn better economic opportunities. It also should not be discounted the number of bears in Alaska. There are approximately 30,000 bears in Alaska and there are certain population centers in Alaska where the bear population rises to as much as one bear per square mile. Although the local people were used to seeing bears and were familiar with the signs of a bear attack, it is possible that generational fear from the story of the Nantanak, coupled with group anxiety and other legends encouraged people to reach a conclusion of Bigfoot instead of a bear when finding a mutilated body in Port Locke. Another possibility is a person or persons with ill intent. A killer could have operated almost undetected in the area, while people believe the attacks to come from a creature. We often like to create legends to justify a belief that people are incapable of such atrocities. However, we see many examples in history of people doing terrible things that resulted in an urban legend being born. Our final thoughts are mixed. The logical conclusion here is that superstition is clouding reason in the case of Portlock, Alaska. However, the belief of these creatures endures to this day. Is it simply a cautionary tale to keep children out of the woods? Or is there something seriously wrong in Portlock, Alaska? So what do you believe? Would you spend a night in Portlock? If you enjoyed this series and would like to see more unexplained content, be sure to subscribe, drop a like, and we'll see you next time.